Welcome to another edition of RCE. I am Brock Palin. You can follow me on Twitter at B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N, and we accept questions, and I post shows when they're up there, too. I also have, again, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the Open MPI Project. Jeff, thanks for helping me out again. Yeah, you also post on your Twitter whenever you're mad at your Sprint account as well, too. Oh, uh, you know, yes, phone yes, I do that, too. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems. And um, you can have a look at my blog. It's out on uh, blogs.cisco.com. It's the performance blog. I talk about MPI and general HPC things out there. Always willing to hear your comments and questions on there. And we have uh, a link to that off of the RCE webpage at rce-cast.com. On there, you can see a form of all the shows we've done, get old shows. Subscribe to the iTunes feed or the RSS feed or download an MP3 directly uh, for you know, putting on your phone or other mobile device. Uh, you can also nominate other show topics on there. We're always looking for new things that you know neither one of us are aware of, and we'd like to hear from what you guys would like to hear about. Yeah, we we always love to hear from the, from the fans because uh, you know every once in a while uh, someone will come up to me or I'll get a random email and say, "Hey, love the show." And so uh, you know we love to hear your feedback, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and if there's anybody in particular you'd like to hear from. So uh, you know, give us a shout out on the yeah, blog, actually, on Twitter, email. Y- you whatever. ran into a, a fan at the Open Fabrics conference, right? You, you That's just right. Got back Last from? week. It's actually a guy I've known for a while, but I had no idea he was listening to the to the podcast. Uh, colleague of mine down at oak ridge and oh. um so yeah it was kind of cool no that's always that's always neat to hear about that so uh and also good to know that you know you're, you're still keeping up and feeding everything from open fabrics and everything else so <laughs> yes the day job keeps me busy <laughs> yes okay well let's go ahead and get to the topic today we have the condor project uh the university of wisconsin but we have an interesting mix of of people here we have um, Greg Thane, who is um, at the University of Wisconsin, as well as Jason Stowe, who's from Cycle Computing. Uh, curious to see how they're affiliated with the Condor Project. Guys, why don't you take a moment to go ahead and you know, state your name and introduce yourself. Good morning. My name is Greg Thane. Uh, I'm a software engineer at the Condor Project at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, I've been with the team for about five years. Uh, I work on what's called the Condor Flightworthy group, the sort of core Condor group. I've worked on a number of different uh, aspects of Condor, including uh, the parallel universe and uh, a lot of performance tuning and other parallel uh, applications on top of Condor. I uh, got a bachelor's degree from uh, the UW uh, longer ago than I care to admit, but uh, went off into the wild world of, of startups, but then came back to, uh, to Madison to do uh, neat distributing computing stuff. Hey, Brock and Jeff. Uh, I'm Jason Stowe. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Cycle Computing. We got started uh, also about five years ago uh, with Condor. I actually worked at a a Disney movie that used Condor to render uh, all the frames of a feature animation and from there decided to start Cycle to help uh, companies be able to take advantage of uh, Condor's full feature set. Um, I actually knew, knew Greg since uh, since about the time he got started, and we're uh, uh, one of the two official kind of corporate partners uh, of the Condor team, helping out with new features and uh, uh, helping users kind of start using Condor internally uh, in their own environment. Okay, so can we get a uh, description of what Condor is? Um, you know, it's resource manager, scheduler, kind of describe. Uh, sure. Um, so Condor is kind of a lot of things, which makes it sort of confusing to explain in uh, a brief soundbite. Um, uh, I think sort of the, the one thing that holds it all together is uh, Condor is a, a set of software to uh, implement the idea that we call a high throughput computing, uh, HTC, as opposed to uh, what a lot of people think about in the supercomputing world, HPC. So we, we really think about the difference between a high throughput versus high performance. So Condor is um, uh, a bunch of programs, a software stack, to implement high-throughput computing. So the core of this, what everyone knows, is the Condor Job Manager, which is um, a batch scheduler like uh, many other batch schedulers. But there's um, several layers of top, uh, software on top of that that um, uh, leverage the scheduler and interact in different ways. Fundamentally, if you look at it from a from a user perspective, Condor helps uh, d- 
describe on a policy basis uh, what should be running uh, across this high throughput environment. So it's it's uh, I like the analogy Greg's used before around uh, a sprinter versus a marathon runner. Uh, Condor definitely favors the marathon runner viewpoint where you want to maximize the utilization of resources over a long period of time. And uh, essentially, Condor provides resource allocation where it figures out exactly what should be running where uh, in that high throughput environment. I've also heard Condor described as a cycle scavenger, um, something basically you put in labs and kind of recover wasted resources uh, in places besides traditional clusters. Is this a good description of it, or is this just like one of many things Condor does? That's kind of the way Condor got started, and a lot of people sort of still know us mainly as a, a cycle scavenger. Um, it fits in with the bird motif. Um, in the early days, um, Condor only ran on, on desktop workstations. And we would uh, scavenge cycles when the machine was idle. And um, it's kind of interesting. We started out, uh, I think our first platform was, uh, was the Vax um, running Ultrix. And, um, <clears throat> you know, those machines were very slow, especially by today's standards. And people were very concerned that um, if Condor was running a job on their system, it would absolutely only run when it was completely idle um, by their definition. And their definition of idleness would change um, a lot. So this really drove us to implement very flexible policies for implementing cycle scavenging and allowing the owner of the resource to determine what idle was. Um, it's not entirely um, obvious what idle means to any particular person, so we need to implement a lot of flexible policies to do that. Um, and this is sort of the way that, that Connor got started, and it's still, um, even though we've grown a lot and we do a lot more than, than simple desktop cycle scavenging, um, it's really part of our DNA. And uh, something interesting, I think, is that um, this idea of uh, what we call opportunistic computing uh, is really still applicable today, um, though perhaps on larger scales. We're not necessarily scavenging from desktops or, or from vaxes, but you can apply this at different scales. You can scavenge um, from a, a cluster or from a campus. So um, even though uh, this desktop cycle scavenging is, is just a small part of what we do today. Uh, the idea really lives on um, in all kinds of different uh, different ways. And it's a very applicable idea that um, can be used in, in uh, a lot of surprising different ways. And, you know, Greg, the, the, the second part of that, too, is that not only do we, um, uh, I, I guess in our observations, about 60 to 70 percent of usage is actually on on dedicated resources and not on harvested uh, resources, we prefer to call it harvested as opposed to scavenged. Um, the key, the key aspect of this, though, in addition, there's also new platforms to be harvested as well. So we've been seeing use cases where we take VMware clusters, where VMware is great at server consolidation. It allows you to, uh, you know, remove physical hardware footprint. Um, but at the same point, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the most resources out of the hardware that's running your VMware environment. And so deploying Condor into those kinds of uh, virtual machine pools is actually a great way to increase utilization of the underlying hardware that you've, you've deployed. So it's, it's not just that there's, there's uh, different scales, but also different environments entirely nowadays, especially uh, for doing harvesting, where that policy management capability that Condor has is very, very helpful. Okay, so that was uh, that was interesting. There, you you actually use the pronoun we, uh, meaning that you guys actually work together with um, University of Wisconsin. So, could you guys could you describe what your relationship is, and you know how do you guys work together? Are you all core developers, or you know what 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 are the roles? Right. So, Condor is an open source project, and um, like many open source projects, we we reach out to the community. We, we can't do it all ourselves. We're uh, very happy to get. Um, contributions back. And uh, I think Jason and Cycle is one of the first uh, first corporate companies to uh, donate code back to back to Condor. Is that right, Jason? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, we've, we've definitely been actively involved uh, in trying to add new features where we see users uh, want them. But, uh, but we also try to supply the beer during Condor week every year as well. Other than that, uh, uh, I think we're mostly involved in evangelizing. Um, Excellent. They, the Condor team guys are actually doing most of the code code lifting. 
okay, so that's cool. That actually sounds like uh, you know working relationships that we see in in various other open source projects, successful open source projects. That is, um, could you you already gave one example of where you know using Condor in places that people may not traditionally assume it. You know, particularly if they're if they're stuck in the initial impressions of Condor from a couple of years ago of of the desktop harvesting and whatnot. So you mentioned virtual machines. What are some other scenarios that you see people deploying Condor? in today? How, how do people use Condor in, in modern environments? Right. There's a lot of flexibility uh, in deploying Condor. So there's a lot of sort of neat ways that people uh, do it, which you might not think of uh, off the top of your head. Um, continuing with the bird theme, uh, one of the neat ways we deploy Condor is something we call Glide-In, which is uh, just part of Condor, the, the execute side, the demons that run on the execute side, which can be submitted as a job themselves to another batch system. So in this way, you can sort of um, dynamically deploy and, and make kind of a, a Condor overlay network. So um, if there's another batch system or, or often um, uh, a set of batch systems, and perhaps they're um, different batch systems, you can't submit to them all in a, in a homogenous way, you can submit Condor and build an ad hoc Condor pool with Glidin. So that's one of the neat ways that you can, uh, you can deploy Condor. Yeah, we've also seen folks do... Uh uh, Condor as a way of, of doing power management. So the, the most recent uh, two versions, two stable series of Condor, 7.2 and 7.4, have included uh, different functionality for powering down resources uh, when there's very little activity on them. So you can actually take advantage of Condor's policy engine to say if this desktop's you know not doing anything, we'd actually like to uh, power it down between the hours of you know 8 p.m. and, and 6 a.m., uh, so that it's hibernated, and then Condor can reactivate the machine. And, and one of the unique things about this is that you get the power management features that that saves people money right up front and saves power. It's a very way of doing good way of doing green computing. Uh, but at the same point, when there's work to be done, you have a, a a grid schedule or a you know a resource manager already installed and and ready to accept work. So you can actually use it as well to run calculations. And that's been kind of a backwards view, I guess, of uh, things we've seen before. Most of the time, people install Condor to run calcs, uh, and then other features are a benefit, but the, uh, but the green computing is sometimes turning out the other way. So are you saying that uh, sometimes people are using Condor literally just for making sure their machines get shut off and turned back on for different things and not necessarily being used as a resource manager and scheduler? Well, it, it still is a resource manager. It's just a, it's a resource manager in terms of consuming power. Um, and generally, in each of those environments, we've always seen them run some form of calculation in the end. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, the initial motivation may be more of uh, using an open source policy engine that can actually uh, you know, manage whether machines are, are hibernated or not is a, a useful feature in and of itself. Um, you know, outside of uh, being able to, to direct the proper workflow to work there at the right time. Uh, both of those are kind of related, but, but still different use cases. Okay, so what's the most common way you see Condor used today? Is it, um, you said that you're seeing mostly actually dedicated hardware. Uh, is it set up more for serial jobs? Does it have the ability to help an MPI launcher? Uh, you know, multi-core accessing different types of specialty hardware like accelerators? Is Condor aware of all these things? Um, so Condor is primarily used to schedule uh, sequential jobs today. Uh, we have the ability to schedule parallel jobs, but um, that's not really uh, in our strike zone. Um, primarily, I think uh, Condor is used to schedule serial jobs, um, often on dedicated or, or a mix of dedicated and opportunistic uh, uh, resources. Um, there's been some neat work done um, at Marquette and, and some other places to run uh, GPU jobs. So uh, because of our very flexible uh, uh, policy language, we can describe both jobs and machines that uh, can access GPUs. So that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, thing we're going forward to do. Now, you mentioned earlier, um, well, you, you just said a second ago that uh, parallel jobs are not really in your strike zone. But you also did say earlier in your in your background that you've done a, some work on the parallel universe in in Condor. So could you explain, like, does it sort of work or are there shortcomings that make it not too workable in, in real world use case scenarios? Or, you know, what, what's the current state of affairs there? I have to ask, you know, my bias being an MPI guy. So, Right. 
Um, so Condor can schedule uh, MPI jobs. Uh, the scheduler is pretty um, uh, simplistic. Uh, you either get FIFO or uh, first bit. Uh, it's not nearly as, as sophisticated. It's like uh, uh, the, the Maui or Torque schedulers. Um, so uh, we think that um, these serial jobs are, are really uh, where our emphasis can be. But if you uh, especially have a mix of parallel and serial jobs, maybe um, uh, you, you want to backfill one with the other, that's potentially a place Condor can play. Um, I think if you just have parallel jobs, Condor is probably not the scheduler for you. Uh, again, this really gets to um, our high throughput computing worldview. Um, high throughput computing is really mainly about uh, running serial jobs. Okay, fair enough. Um, one follow-up question on that, though. The, the uh, so a, a lot of what Condor does, or at least my perception of what it does, um, has been you know the migration of serial jobs around, or at least that was a significant part of Condor's history. Is that still how people do this, or has the migration towards more dedicated resources kind of obviated the need to do that? Um, I, I think not at all. What we've seen is that um, uh, as people build dedicated clusters, the concepts of, of overflow and, and opportunistic computing exist there, too. Uh, for example, very frequently on campus, you'll see um, several departments each having a, a rack of computers, um, uh, and the usage is very um, bursty. Right, often before uh, a conference uh, paper deadline, there'll be a huge uh, demand for the machines, a, a demand which will often overflow uh, any group's clusters, where um, the other, other clusters on campus may be idle at that time. So there's uh, a great need to migrate jobs from one cluster to another. So I think that uh, these problems uh, still exist, but often at, at kind of a bigger scale. And then uh, not, just, uh, not just on the campus scale, but uh, again, at an even bigger scale, uh, the open science grid does this in spades. And we, we've actually seen in, in companies as well the same kind of use cases where you may have uh, a mixture of serial and, and parallel jobs. There definitely are cluster environments like, you know, Jeff, uh, I'm sure the ones that you're familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis run uh, quite a bit of MPI work. But, um, but frequently we find that there's a, a mixture of uh, throughput-oriented applications and uh, performance-oriented applications, and that's that's one of the things that Condor really excels at. So again, running back to my bias here, uh, do you have any uh, MPIs that support Condor better than others, or are there any that take advantage of your checkpointing capabilities and migration capabilities? Um, not right now. We tend to be pretty uh, MPI agnostic. Um, of our MPI users, uh, they're pretty... Uh, uh, pretty diverse in terms of MPI implementations. Uh, we still have a lot of people using MPitch, uh, even version 1 from time to time. Uh, and, of course, OpenMPI is, is coming on strong. But there's still some LAM users in there, too, and uh, there's just a wide diversity of, of, of MPI. Every time you run into a LAM user, please tell them to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that. I was the LAM guy, and we've been trying to get people to stop using LAM for years. <laughs> Yeah, we've we've seen the same thing with uh, Open MPI. It's been adopted quite a bit, and, and thankfully, in the corporate environment, I have I've yet to really come across a real uh, hardcore LAM user. Uh, we've, we've mostly been the same kind of mixture where it's uh, MPitch and uh, the newer versions, especially and Open MPI, especially. Okay, so talking about running um, between uh, different. Condor installation. Oh, yeah. What's a Condor installation called? Was was that a flock or am I understanding that correctly? We like the term. We use the term pool. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that's uh, in contradiction to a lot of other uh, standard industry usage. Um, there's also the term flock, um, which uh, is probably used less. There's a, a, a technical term, Condor flocking, which is a way to mic to uh, federate a lot of different pools. Um, so usually we, we talk about Condor pools. Okay, so a Condor pool is normally just like a set of compute hosts that talk to a single server, and flocking is kind of moving jobs between servers and federating these servers together? That's right. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of other differences between a lot of schedulers from a scalability standpoint. So most, you mentioned a, f a bunch of execute nodes. 
uh, talking to a single server. There is generally at any one point in time a, a single central manager. That's the, the piece that does the negotiation between jobs that need to be run and resources that are available to run them. However, there also can be multiple schedulers uh, within a, a Condor pool. So as opposed to you know, a SunGrid engine, for example, or a, a job tracker on Hadoop, um, Condor has the capability of having many uh, managers of job queues, uh, each of them capable of operating independently to server, service jobs uh, against execute nodes. And what that leads is higher throughput. Uh, so you have many schedulers potentially coordinating job flow uh, as well as being able to do um, uh, execution of jobs uh, in greater volumes because, uh, again, if you need to be able to handle uh, more jobs than a single scheduler can have, you can actually have tens or hundreds of schedulers in a pool uh, with no issue. Right. That's really been our scalability uh, strategy. Is uh, Our central manager is a, a, a stateless, uh, pretty um, low CPU, uh, has low CPU requirements, uh, and we can add schedulers uh, to the system almost indefinitely. So we can really uh, scale by adding lots of schedulers to uh, a fairly large pool. Okay. So how do you handle like users on authentication? Do they just, you know, users need to exist on all systems? Or how does this actually help if, like, say, two separate institutions want to combine their resources? Right. Uh, user identity is, is a, probably the biggest problem when, when federating um, two different pools. Uh, one interesting thing about Condor, I think, is we have the ability to um, use what we call run accounts. When the job is actually run, the Unix user ID under which it is run can be run by a dedicated account that's local to that host and per slot. Um, there's a lot of advantage of this. One is it's, it's very easy to track all the processes on that exact host. One thing that Condor does, I think, exceptionally well is if you run a job, a Unix job that forks or, or spawns threads, when that job exits, when the, the head process exits, uh, Condor can kill all the sub-processes, even ones that have forked, even ones which have gone out of their way to uh, try and hide from the system. Um, and uh, being able to run the jobs as a uh, dedicated run account is a, a, a very important way that we can do that. Um, now. Obviously, when you, you federate, you need to uh, have identity management, and there's a couple of ways Condor can do that. Um, the most sophisticated is we support the, um, the GSI uh, authentication. So it's a uh, X400-based, um, uh, certificate-based uh, identity system, and you can, uh, on a very fine-grained basis, uh, describe who is allowed to submit, even from remote sides. Okay, I have a question back on something you mentioned earlier, and it actually relates to a question Greg asked from Twitter. Uh, how do you, can Condor be controlled by a different scheduler? Like, could we actually remove the Condor scheduler and control this Condor resource manager with, say, you know, Moab or Maui or you know, the Slurm scheduling engine or anything like that? Oh, what a great, what a what an interesting question. Um, not directly. But there are ways to, um, uh, via Condor G or or, uh, or or even Glidin, to submit from one to the other. So I think uh, Condor resources can't be directly scheduled, but you could build up a uh, an ad hoc Condor pool, and um, uh, and federate uh, federate uh, pools with with other schedulers that way. Um, I think one of the, the nice things about Condor. Uh, organizationally, is because we're open source, because we're not commercial, um, we don't really have a uh, sort of all or nothing approach to uh, other vendors. Um, you know, we, we try and federate and, and, and work with um, other systems as it makes sense for our users. You know, we're not, um, we're not trying to sell you, and it's not a, and it's not a zero sum game. Correct. We, we've definitely seen uh, the same kind of uh, use cases where folks will run. Um, you know, this gets back to the question of, of should you run Condor on, a, on an HPC environment in particular uh, if you've got another scheduler. We, we see that all the time, whether it's, you know, folks like Purdue University, they've got some very large uh, MPI-oriented machines uh, that also run Condor to do scavenging and kind of fill in the usage cracks um, with high-throughput work. Um, there's very, very, very large number of use cases around running Condor uh, as part of, um, you know, LSF and, and SunGrid Engine and a few other 
uh, scheduling environments, and, and, and even in an upcoming, you know, an upcoming release, uh, there's already some integration with Hadoop and, and Condor, and I know that's one of the things that we're most excited about, uh, kind of going forward in, in future releases, uh, is that uh, that work and that functionality. So you say in a lot of installs that we're basically installing Condor alongside, say, PBS and Moab, and there'll be a group of serial high throughput users submitting to Condor and they may be running on the same resources. And then does Condor just kind of migrate the jobs out using Condor's checkpointing functionality? Oh, and could you explain the Condor checkpointing functionality? I think Jeff alluded to that, but I I don't think it was clear. Yeah, I think if there's one bit of magic in Condor, uh, it's it's the checkpointing stuff. And maybe that's one thing we're really known for. Uh, Condor can optionally uh, checkpoint jobs uh, for jobs to be checkpointable automatically by Condor, there are a few restrictions. Uh, they're the kind of restrictions you, you might imagine. Uh, the jobs can't have a, an open network connection. We can only checkpoint one process, so the, the jobs can't fork or, or have threads. Uh, and there's a few other minor restrictions. But, but if your jobs fall into these categories, then you can uh, link them with the Condor checkpointing library, and you get uh, process uh, checkpointing and migration for free, which, which I think is really neat. And this is sort of the way we started out. Um, and with this checkpointing, uh, although your jobs don't have to checkpoint, Condor can uh, periodically save the, the contents of their memory, uh, send them back to a checkpoint server or the Smith machine, and then restart them elsewhere. Uh, I, I think this is uh, really what, what Condor is known for. Uh, however, not all jobs are checkpointable. And a lot of people uh, with this high throughput or this sort of backfill or opportunistic computing um, run what we call vanilla jobs, non-checkpointable jobs, and uh, just let the system kill the job when it's um, uh, when it needs to preempt. And uh, a lot of people worry about this a lot, but um, I think that uh, if you have the chance to finish your job, you, you might as well give it an opportunity, even if there's some chance of, of what we call bad put, of the job being killed and, and needing to restart from scratch. So how did you guys, how did you get here? So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the beginnings of Condor with the, you know, the, the desktop harvesting and whatnot, but how did you, how did you get to where you are today? Because this is a very successful project that has existed for, gosh, I, I don't know, when did you guys start? I mean, this is well over 10 years now, right? Or, or 15. Um, but, yeah, you know, how did you up. evolve and, and how did, uh, you know, how did you get to where you are today? I think the key, uh, a key bit of Condor is it's always been very user-driven. Um, Condor started, I'm embarrassed to say this, in 1986. So it's really been going a long time, and, and there's a lot, wow. of, uh, a lot of different aspects of, uh, of Condor. I think this uh, being user-driven is really how we, how we migrated. We started out on campus, and we had a lot of um, uh, very influential uh, users in the computer science department. Uh, and then we moved on to, to physics and then off to um, uh, other sites. And, and I think when we start getting commercial users, and maybe Jason can talk to this a little bit, that, that's really, um, I think, where a lot of our, we, our features started to bloom and, and we got a lot more traction when it, it wasn't just a university project, but the people making money uh, depended on Condor for their livelihood. Yeah, I know when we worked on the, the Disney production for The Wild, it was a, a feature animation. Um, you know, Condor offered both a, an exceptionally cost-effective and the Condor team uh, a very talented partner uh, for that production to be able to, uh, to, we did, I think we had a number 84 on the top 500 list at the time, a 1,000 uh, Linux cores, 256 Mac uh, XServe cores, and, uh, and about 300 workstations that we harvested off of. And uh, it, was, it was a great thing to be able to run. I think we, we ran about 75 million renders uh, through the system at that time. And since then, you've seen a lot of, a lot of companies actually. So pro- odds are if you have a, uh, an annuity, a, a retirement package that, that includes annuities, um, you're, you're most likely the risk for hedging on those annuities is calculated using Condor. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has several thousand cores that they've described. Uh, running on trader desktops that they harvest every night. Um, I know that their annuity risk is generally on a dedicated server model. Uh, we've also got folks like uh, Eli Lilly and Pfizer that have done, you know, essentially drug target and uh, other forms of uh, uh, drug discovery pipelines, including next generation sequencing. We've, we've seen a lot of work uh, being done on, on sequence analysis. 
Um, you mentioned working alongside PBS. The guys at uh, ConocoPhillips have done work in that area around Condor and, and other schedulers uh, cooperating. Electronic Arts uses it for, for running uh, renders across uh, uh, different servers and workstations. So there's uh, quite a lot of uh, different traction in different industries where people are, uh, people are adopting it commercially to actually do production work. So you've mentioned it twice now, and so I, I, I therefore have to ask. You said that Condor, you know, your your origins were uh, when you were using it to render a feature length film. Can you can you say which one? Yeah, it's the it's a film called The Wild. It's uh, a uh, uh, I, I, I'm actually forgetting what year it was actually released. Now it was in I think oh six <laughs> uh, that it was it was released. It's uh, it's great for kids if you if you follow. Um, but uh, but sure. yeah, it was it was very. Uh, uh, the rendering was absolutely beautiful in the movie. The guys that uh, worked on on all aspects of the pipeline uh, uh, were great, but we had a lot of really big requirements. So, you know, millions of jobs uh, for crowd scenes, for example, were a somewhat common event where you had to be able to uh, handle a very massive scale. We added uh, uh, accounting groups into Condor as a, a feature in order to, to meet uh, our prioritization requirements. So essentially, uh, most schedulers operate on uh, uh, queues or on users as the uh, priority element. And in Condor, you can actually make it any arbitrary uh, designation you want. So you can you can create groups of, of users based on, uh, for example, projects, or, or in our case, uh, we, we grouped jobs by a uh, team that was working on them. So, uh, so for example, lighting versus character finaling. Um, another option is to, to use uh, any arbitrary unit of work. Uh, you know, for example, in a movie, a sequence and shot are, are kind of the designation of, of any individual camera move. So, you know, you get five or six seconds of footage that are the camera pointing at one character, then pointing at another character. That's a shot. Um, that that could also be a, a, a unit that you want to prioritize based on. This some shots are more important than others, for example, uh, because maybe the director has to look at them at the end of the day. So that that was a, an example of a feature that we kind of bore in there based on on heavy usage. Okay, and it, so we digressed on this a little bit, but I, I wanted to go back to one point: um, the uh, the evolution of, of Condor from an academic project to be a you know a real full fledged real world everybody can use it kind of package and. I just want to say, at least in my experience, um, it's actually fairly rare um, that there is an academic project whose target is actual users. And it's not only a vehicle for papers, but it's actually, uh, you know, intended to be used in the real world and solicit feedback and research that way. Was this uh, one of the original goals of the Condor product or did it just kind of just kind of happen that way? I don't think it was one of the original goals, but I think. Uh, as we developed more of a need to do software engineering, I, I think we realized that um, this is an area that the, the traditional computer science community has really um, not done a good job at. Um, you know, I remember when I was in school, um, every single week I'd write a main, you know, and, and write a program and deliver an executable. And uh, I think I write a main about every 10 years when I'm uh, a, a professional programmer. You know, and I think uh, what uh, Marone realized is that there's a really strong need to train uh, students, graduate and undergraduate, in a lot of the, the nitty-gritty details of, of software engineering. And I think Condor is a, has, has been a great um, asset for the university for doing this kind of real-world software engineering training. So uh, you mentioned Marone there. You want to give a little more attribution? <laughs> ah, right. Sorry. So that's uh, Marone Lifney, who's the PI, and he's the... the the person who came up with the, the, the Condor idea, and he's our head Condor. He's a, a full professor uh, of computer science at the University of Wisconsin, and um, he started the Condor project in 86 and has kept it going since then. And I know from a, from a user perspective, uh, uh, Jeff, that, that Marin is um, uh, great at, at both helping us out with new features and, and trying to make sure that they're structured in a, in a way that'll, that'll scale across um, you know, the different user communities that we have. He, he has a, a keen eye for, for design just as a, a you know, from a third party perspective. Um, he, he very much eat, breathes and sleeps the, the philosophy of, of high throughput. 
Uh, that's something that uh, you know is, is I think really unique about him is that he's his vision for uh, for essentially keeping machines busy all the time with the right type of work and in a way that's easily administratable or, or, or uh, policy specifiable, if those are words. Um, that's that's something that I, I know he uh, excels at over and over again. So Condor has been around for a long time. Um, what was what's what's Condor actually written in? Is C C plus uh, plus? You know, when it was running on to Vax, was it some weird assembly or some other strange dialect? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, Condor started out, I think, like a lot of projects of its day in C, and uh, sort of migrated over time to C plus plus. I, I think. Today, uh, almost all of it's in C++. There's a few uh, C functions lying around. There's the occasional uh, uh, bit of assembly, especially in our checkpointing libraries, to do the really the low-level gronky stuff. And there's a little bit of Java code to interface to uh, some external Java libraries. But, but primarily it's C++. Okay, and then what platforms does it actually run on? Uh, one of the common uses I see is actually like, um, getting cycles off of Windows machines. That's right. It primarily runs on uh, Windows and Linux, uh, although we do support uh, some of the other, other uh, older versions of Unix, but we see uh, less and less uh, demand for that. Uh, we also run the Mac, which is uh, becoming more and more popular, uh, especially um, to uh, use a, a Mac laptop perhaps to submit to uh, a cluster maybe of non-Macs. Uh, when we say we run on these machines, we're very uh, heterogeneous, so uh, you can submit from one kind of machine uh, to a pool of, of a completely different architecture. Uh, this is often common, um, and I think uh, some of Jason's stuff has done this, where um, for uh, reliability reasons, you might want to have um, a Linux central manager or maybe a Linux scheduler, um, but because your, your jobs may be Windows jobs, you may have a, a pool of Windows or perhaps a mixed pool of Windows and, and Unix machines. That's definitely a common architecture. We see that one over and over again, especially when it comes to harvesting Windows workstations. The the UTC mentioned Brock. That's that's very common. Yeah. So there was a uh, Condor pool um, in TerraGrid from Purdue, and that thing was actually really big. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's decent size. It's the largest I've ever seen for Condor. It was fourteen thousand CPUs in that pool. And they were constantly saying how many they had Linux, how many they had Windows, how many they had running Solaris. Uh, what, what's actually the largest Condor install you guys have ever seen? Uh, I think it's kind of hard to measure, uh, especially as we federate pools. Uh, but I believe that, that currently Purdue has the largest Condor pool. And I, I, I think right now they're over 20,000. Um, so we do scale up. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, actually, they're at, they're at 30 plus K right now. I see that. That's how fast they Yep. Uh, Purdue is actually kind of interesting in that um, they have a, a campus-wide mandate, uh, I believe from their chancellor, that says that every computer on the Purdue campus must either be running Condor and, and scavenge the cycles off of it or be turned off at night. So we think this is a pretty uh, a forward-thinking approach to have a very uh, campus-wide uh, directive to, uh, to, to be more green. All right, so this might be kind of a difficult question to answer given that, you know, you support such a, a wide variety of, of running environments and scenarios. But just from your personal points of view, what's the strangest use you've ever seen of Condor? Or most, you know, strange is not necessarily the right one, but perhaps most unexpected or, wow, I never would have thought of that kind of scenario. Hmm. Um, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh you know, there's a, uh, a thing called a Google vanity search where you type in your own name to Google and, and see what comes up. And uh, I think if you want to take the level of vainness one step further, uh, Google has this great product called Google Alerts uh, where you can sort of do that on a periodic basis. And when it finds something new, it emails you. And uh, I do this with Condor. And, and I recommend anyone who works on an open source project or, or any software project do the same thing. And it, it's just amazing um, every week uh, Google will find a new Condor user that I hadn't heard of. Uh, that we had never talked to. Um, just a couple weeks ago, there was one, uh, a research group in Singapore. And again, this is a group that's never talked to us, never asked any questions on our, our email lists, um, posted a paper wherein they had used Condor um, to analyze various different uh, strategies uh, for their Navy to repel pirates around the islands. So 
so they developed a different strategy where to put uh, the, the big ships versus the little ships, and uh, they uh, modeled uh, pirate strategy and naval strategy and trying to come up with the best strategy for, for fighting pirates. So uh, that was completely unanticipated and you know, not what I would have thought that any Condor user would, uh, would need to use Condor for. Maybe you know, I, I thought I thought I was going to remark on on Google Alerts, uh, but I just have to answer the pirate thing. That is just so cool. And that is You're amazing. Gonna, that that gives a whole new meaning to to Pirate Day uh, when when all you Condor guys go into work wearing eye patches. I think. Yeah, I don't think I can. Like it's yeah. Talk about Pirate Day has all all new meaning now. So yeah, I also have to plus one on the whole Google Alerts thing because I I do that myself for for my open source project and. <laughs> Also, my, my competition, uh, well, <clears throat> minor pride there. But it, it's also nice to see that, you know, my project happens and then the other guys too. But, yes, it's, it's a fantastic way, uh, being an open source guy myself, to see where it's going. Because exactly as you said, you don't necessarily know that people don't talk to you, particularly if they download your software and it works. But they might write a blog entry about it or post to it on some forum that you've never heard of or or something like that. It's a great way to find out about it in the wild. And I also use them as a way of someone, you know, is ranting about open MPI. They couldn't get it to do something or other. Well, I'll just go sign up on that forum and answer their question. It's actually very useful. Yeah, I haven't, we haven't actually seen anybody doing pirate protection or uh, <laughs> you know, various swarthy strategies. I think the, the key ones that we've seen are all what you would expect, but uh, uh, but might be unexpected. So the great thing about Condor Week uh, every year, and, and this year it's uh, it's on April 12th uh, up at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, is you get to hear all different kinds of use cases. So we've people have come and talked about how uh, they catch students running MP3 uh, encoding uh, applications on their their desktops at their university running Condor. Um, we've also had uh, folks talk about doing uh, song analysis, so taking the you know the net results of, uh, of of audio files and trying to figure out which songs are are near each other. I think the the, the research is is from you know from pirates to uh, uh, to musical similarity. Uh, and everywhere in between, uh, you can imagine use cases. Corporate use cases generally tend to be uh, stuff that, that might seem boring, but is uh, is actually kind of you know real world stuff you use every day. So you know whether it's you know kind of dividing, designing new products, new chips. Um, in terms of uh, Altera uses Condor to do the FPGA work that they do. They they test software uh, on the back end using Condor. Um, we end up uh, seeing a lot of use cases around risk analysis and around you know protecting uh, uh, annuities and retirement contracts. That's a very common one. Um, another one that uh, that that is uh, maybe a little bit uh, a little bit strange is is kind of a lot of the work that's going on with genomics. That's that's been something that I know has been a, a big eye opener for us. Has been essentially. Uh, the work on now that the human genome project's done, people are creating instruments that, at reasonable costs, i.e., thousands of dollars, uh, can can produce a genome. And, and the target is to be able to do this in around a thousand bucks, you know, within a, a year or two. Um, and essentially, processing all that genetic data is something that um, uh, you know the types of gene searches they do, uh, and the impact it has on um, you know essentially being able to to discover autoimmune diseases, um, you know like your diabetes, your MS, etc. Um, it's amazing uh, uh, you know the different application areas that you bump into every day uh, with a project like Condor. So, as an open source project, how do you guys manage? I, I would imagine that. The majority of, uh, I think you said earlier, the heavy lifting is done back at Wisconsin. But do you do you get random patches from people? Um, do you have other people around the world looking in your source code, making suggestions, submitting bug fixes, things like that? Uh, that uh, assuming that you write bugs, which you probably don't. <laughs> Just undocumented features. That's uh, right. Yeah, so uh, uh, as Jason alluded to, uh, most of the heavy lifting is done at UW-Madison. Um, like many open source projects, um, I would say now maybe 10 to 15 percent of the code uh, is uh, written by um, people outside of Madison who are, who are paid to write Condor code. Um, we have a good uh, close relationship with Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat has hired, um, I don't know the number, it's like six or seven engineers who are full-time Condor engineers who contribute back to the Condor project every day. Um, so just like the Linux kernel, um, it's not necessarily... 
um, some random person uh, that you never heard of who uh, submits code out of the blue, although that, that does happen from time to time. But there are a lot of full-time paid employees uh, who aren't employees uh, of UW-Madison or the Condor Project who contribute daily uh, back to the code base. And so a follow-up on that. This is a question I ask all open source people just because uh, out of genuine curiosity. What do you guys use for source code management and why? Ah, so... Um, about a year and a half ago, we switched from CVS to Git. So we, uh, we use Git exclusively now. Um, and we kind of have a love-hate relationship with Git. Uh, what do you guys use? <laughs> so we use Subversion, but we combine it with Mercurial as well. So Subversion is kind of our, our main back-end one, but we basically do all branching in Mercurial. So I would say at least 75% of OpenMPI development is, is done in Mercurial and then eventually pushed up to Subversion. But boy, that's, that's quite a jump from CVS to Git. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, like I said, we have a love-hate relationship with Git. There's certain things it makes really easy to do, and then other things are, are kind of hard to do. So um, uh, I think a good, um, uh, a good benchmark of your version control system is how often you revert a patch. You know, I, I've worked in a lot of places where people are sort of terrified to revert patches, and they, they never do it. And I think um, if you're in that mode, you're not really using your version control. You're, you're really just using kind of a, a fancy backup system almost. Um, but we do uh, revert patches from time to time, and that's not a big, scary um, operation like it might be in, in other uh, version control systems. So I think uh, all in all, we, we like Git. Um, it, it's not perfect, though. Okay, guys. Well, w let's get some contact information for Condor. Uh, is there a mailing list, website, download packages, Cycle Computing's website? Uh, sure. So the... Um, Probably the easiest URL to remember is condorproject.org. Uh, so that'll redirect into a, a complicated University of Wisconsin site. Uh, and then there's um, uh, uh, the Condor users email list, uh, which you can find on condorproject.org. Um, we also have um, a, a ticketing system. So if you, on the off chance that you find a bug, uh, you can send us uh, uh, a, a bug report and we will fix that uh, on a best effort basis. If you need more contracted support, uh, there are several organizations, uh, including Cycle, that can uh, provide paid support for Condor. Uh, maybe Jason can speak to those. So, yeah, Cycle definitely provides uh, support for, for corporations. We can be reached at cyclecomputing.com. We also have uh, uh, management tools that uh, we're actually going to be making downloadable uh, in the coming weeks leading up to uh, Condor Week itself. Uh, to make it very easy to have a you know kind of a business analytics for HPC environments uh, style view into what's going on to very large condor pools. We work with Purdue on their uh, thirty thousand plus core environment to uh, to help make that manageable, as well as a lot of the uh, various companies I've mentioned uh, earlier in the broadcast. Hey, so what what's this Condor Week thing? When is it, and where is it? So Condor Week is uh, is an annual event. It's been uh, uh, held every year for for at least the last ten years. I don't know, Greg, if there's a, a longer duration than that. But um, yeah, I forget what the first one was, but it, it goes back at least ten years. And generally, there's a confluence of uh, government research, university research, and uh, corporations uh, that come and talk about various use cases around Condor. What's new? What's happening in the next uh, uh, next week? Talks and. Uh, um, every year for the past, I think, four or five years that Cycle's been around, we've also sponsored kind of a, uh, a meet and greet uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, on, generally on a Tuesday evening um, of every Condor week for, for people to get together and kind of share stories and, and, and have a few drinks together. Cool. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're all set here. Uh, this will go out this weekend. And thanks a lot for taking some time to talk with us. We appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you guys for having us on. Yeah. Thank you.